Podcast One presents the Steve Austin Show Classics. Just fired back up the microphones, continuing my conversation with Paul Hammond. We sit there after I push the stop button. We've talked for an hour and a half, two hours, about stuff that is better left uh, between two guys without a microphone running. Well, if I'd like to stay employed on this basis at the moment, I think we should keep all that off the record. But so anyway, I always like to, uh, when I rolled into Russell Mays, just like I said before, I, I always do my research. I didn't get a chance to do any research. We called this thing in the ring, but I forgot to mention your social media account, Hammond Hustle. Yes, sir. On Twitter. Yes. But now let's talk about HammondHustle.com. Is that it? Yes. Okay, tell me a little bit about the website, because I was talking to you about a couple of years ago. I was going to start a website, and I was having a hard time coming up with content and all this stuff, and you started going into techno uh, mode on me. So tell me a little bit about the, the Heyman Hustle website and what it's all about. Well, the Heyman Hustle website started actually as a video show that we were doing for the UK Sun, because the, the Murdoch family, you know, Fox, was getting into the digital world. They wanted to do broadband television, which, by the way, is exactly what the WWE network is today. Regular streaming programming on a digital network. And they were getting that in a thing called Sun TV. And they wanted a flagship program for Sun TV, and we sold them on the concept of a weekly celebrity interview vlog with Paul Heyman interviewing ice tea and Coco or James Lipton or Jesse Ventura or, or, or whomever my guest may be. And um, so from that, we started doing also digital post-production. So the next thing I know, my partner and I have a, a digital post-production house in New York City. And, and in the, a basement? Um, no, actually, actually, we're on the fourth floor. <laughs> but nothing wrong if we were to move it to the basement. <laughs> and if I can afford a big enough house to where my kids won't bother me yeah. in the basement or join me and learn how to edit, that's where we'll put the studio. So we open up a digital production house in New York City, and that starts doing really, really well because we're the first really high-quality, high-definition digital production service in New York City. And, of course, my love is always in promoting, advertising, marketing, branding. Um, so we expanded that when we took the name, the Heyman Hustle, and then launched HeymanHustle.com and started feeding content and our video series and pictures from MMA and WWE and, and, and kind of taking the maxim route of also doing hot girls. Right. So, you know, it, it's, you, know, you know the old theory, what do guys like? Sex and sports. Give them sex, give them sports, a guy will watch, a guy will tune in. It'll be destination viewership, destination website. Um, so if you we, could have cyber beer pour out of Heyman Hustle. You would have all the bases covered. I agree with the sex and sports. Could we have as the guy that's that that's the face of that company, Stone Cold Steve Austin? There you go. Hey, yeah, so I'm keep going. In business together already. So um, now we we take the Heyman Hustle and we start doing video game campaigns on the website. Click here to to get to this site. Um, the, the next five people that email us the right answer to this question win the video game. And we're doing so well in video game promotion that now we decide, hey, why not open up a social media slash digital advertising, marketing, and branding firm? So we open up what we call the Looking for Larry Agency. And the the face of the company, the, the centerpiece of our company is our website, the Heyman Hustle website. So I always go to, to the Heyman Hustle website and check it out. Lots of good-looking women. And I, I have time on your time. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you, you said it. It's a place where guys would go. Yes. So, and then have time on your timeline. I mean, you have just all these gorgeous models on there. Well, what happened was, it's a very funny story. We were um, publishing a bunch of international models who were looking for a big break. From Australia, from New Zealand, from South Africa. Um, and a, a very famous rock and roll designer from the United States tweeted one day, does anybody have a temporary tattoo? I'd like to put the Heyman Hustle logo on my ass and wear a thong to the beach. And as a joke, I cut and pasted and wrote hashtag hustle booty temp tats. And in five minutes, it was trending worldwide. And I said, man, what do we stumble on here? Now, there was a Playboy cyber girl, this beautiful blonde girl from Florida named Carrie Nautique. Mm -hmm. And she was getting this huge push by Playboy. And she writes, send me two, one for each butt cheek. And she writes, hustle booty temp tats. And it goes viral. It starts trending worldwide. 
Now this very famous reality star who's this sizzling hot model over in the UK, she's a Greek-Irish girl named Georgia Salpa. And she is the page three girl of the year. She is on the cover of all the tabloids in the UK. She is the, she's the Kim Kardashian of the UK. She's the sensation of the moment. And she writes, I'd love to wear hashtag hustle booty temp patch. <laughs> so now these women are sending in pictures and it can even be an upper body picture. Right. But the, the tagline for a hot looking woman in a in a bikini pic or a lingerie pic or whatever, just a hot pic of a hot woman becomes hustle booty temp tats. This past year, we did the hustle booty temp tats top 25. And we did it as a viral marketing campaign because now you get the models to promote, hey, go to the Heyman Hustle site and vote for me. Yeah. Sends me the traffic, raises my advertising rates, makes them more famous. And we did a we did such a big viral campaign, we did bigger numbers than the maximum one hundred on a global basis. Really? Yeah. So it just became this phenomenon that kind of just took on a life of its own. What if I put on a hustle booty tip tat and sent in a picture? Would I make the top 25? I think just because you're Stone Cold Steve Austin, if you put it on the top of your head, we'd have to pay you for the advertising space. You're doing this, all this, uh, and you, you got your start in, you know, as a photographer, into the wrestling business, one of the greatest managers of all time. So did you go to college? Yes. I, I, I got an associate's degree in New York from SUNY Purchase uh, because I, I studied political science, and I also double majored in communication while because I was doing, and I got credit. That was a funny thing. I got credit for doing college radio. So I did college radio at SUNY Purchase and Westchester Community College at the same time while I was editing three wrestling magazines and traveling and doing the play-by-play on the independents and doing the publicity and promotions at Studio 54. Here's a real stupid question, but when you're majoring in communications, what do they teach you? Is, is it all... I hope you don't mind a stupid answer to the stupid I will, I, question. I got to have it. It's a stupid question. Um... I did radio. <laughs> I no, did. no, no, but is there techniques? I mean, like, what do you, you know? What, no, what, I just did college radio and got credit in communications. Really? Yeah, it was, you know. Hey, I, but I, it's I got not speech class after speech class and how to speak clearly and try to get. Ah, I learned how to speak from watching my father perform in front of a jury all those years. Yeah. That was it. I, I, so I, then where, where did you pick up all the technology skills now with Heyman Hustle doing all this vlog stuff and all this, you know, the digital content? How do you get your brain wrapped around that? Um, one of the things that we do at my agency is. And I think it's the strongest thing that we do. We do a think tank as often as we can. It used to be when I, when I wasn't on the road, when I wasn't back in WWE, it was probably every month. And now it's about every other month, every six weeks or so. Uh, we do a think tank. And that's any kid from New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, even Massachusetts um, who goes to college. And if you go to college and you take ma- ma- mass transit, t- take a... Um, um, you know, municipal transit. Oh my God! I can't believe I can't. Taking buses, subway. Uh, right. Take a bus. Yeah. Right. Take, take a bus. Or take mass a transit. transit. Mass transit. And and you take it to our office. We will cover the cost because it's, it's 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 inexpensive. Now, if you take your own limo, you drive your own car, you take a rent a car, you take a cab, you're on your own. Right. But 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 if you take a bus or a subway and you come to our office, we'll reimburse you the cost of that mass transit, and we also feed them, and we have all these to participate kids. in your think tank. Yes. So, Jesus, I mean, how many people getting in a think tank? 75, 150. So where where are you holding this? I mean, In our a... office. We, we have the whole fourth floor. In, okay. In, we have a, a pre- pretty nice big office in Gramercy. And, um, and, and, and we cater it. You know, right. pizza, right. the local Korean barbecue place, uh, you know, hamburgers, whatever it is. And we talk about everything with these college kids. And you have to be assertive enough or aggressive enough or ambitious enough to come see us to begin with. Mm-hmm. So here you have these assertive, ambitious college kids from NYU, Columbia, Hofstra. Uh, you know, we've had kids come down from, you know, from Yale, from, from, uh, from, from, from Connecticut, Harvard, and, you know, community colleges too. I don't care. We're not snobs about this. As long as, long as you're in college and you take mass transportation to our office, we'll reimburse you. And if you don't take mass transportation, you're welcome to come in. We'll still feed you, and we talk about everything. So, but it's a think tank to generate ideas to use on Heyman Hustle? Uh, think tank is generate ideas to do anything. Anything. Like, anything. But then, one, okay, someone comes down from Yale. They come up with a big idea. 
it's your property, you own it, uh, we discuss it with them. If, if, if they come up with a big idea, we immediately, we will sign them to a job. Right. And we will develop their concept. Or we don't just steal these kids' concepts. Cause right. You, 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 number one, um, despite the character I play on TV, I do have I do have some sort of ethics. Number two, my partner is so freaking ethical; he drives me crazy. Number right. three, who needs to be sued? Right. So, um, and plus, if a kid comes up with the next big idea, I want that kid in my fold for the next ten years. Right. Why would I want to cast out the next Steve Jobs or the next Bill Gates? Why would I want to be the guy that gave him his biggest break? I gave you a small break when you were already known, and to this day, look how nice you are to me. I gave CM Punk a break when he first came to WWE, and when I came back and I had no one to work with after Brock took a hiatus, look at the work we got to do together. I gave Brock a break, and he was in the same company as I was. It was my job to give breaks to people, but I gave Brock a little bit more of a break than the other producers or the writers would do, and I've been riding his coattails for 12 years off of it. Wouldn't I want that for the next Steve Jobs or the next Bill Gates or the next Eric Schmidt or whomever the next uh, or the next um, uh, Zuckerman, whatever, whatever, Mark yeah. Zuckerman? Of course I would. So th- when these kids come in, we talk about sports. We talk about women. We talk about technology. We talk about politics. We talk about music. I'm 48 years old. Where do I get a youthful idea? Well, you know, my, my daughter is, is 11 and, and far hipper than I am. And my son is nine and, 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 and far cooler than I will ever be. So I get ideas from them. But how am I going to tap into the 20-year-olds? You know, where, where is the future? You know, uh, hey, is the BlackBerry or the iPhone going to make it? Is, right. it, is it? You know, is our podcast the future or are YouTube videos the future? Exactly which way would you position it? What's the buzzword that makes people understand I'm a 48-year-old? old geezer and what's the word that makes them think yo man this dude has his finger on the pulse and that's what i want from these kids because i listen to them talk and i go okay that's how i can sound cool right yeah man say this word and don't think you're with it oh cool okay so how much of uh, your time does this take with your schedule being on the road uh Again, we only get to do it now about every six weeks or so That's the think weeks. tank. I'm talking about you know yeah. you, just your involvement in doing your thing with Heyman Hustle. Oh, Heyman Hustle is a daily enterprise for me. I mean, we, we, we keep that website flowing as much as we can with as much content as we can. I wish I had time for far more content, but I make sure that everything that's on that site has a purpose and a strategy. And that's to drive people to be interactive with us on the Twitter uh, or on face on the Twitter, see yeah, that that's yeah. the, right there. That's a no no yeah. on Twitter. You know, it's like like when when Twitter first came out, I sat down and I kept telling my guy, "Listen, post this on Twitter." And finally, um, one of these kids pulled me aside. and went, "You don't post things on Twitter. You tweet them." And I was like, "Yeah, well, that's what I meant. You <laughs> you tweet that on Twitter, you know." And so I mean, that, you know, when did you start your Twitter account? Steve, I really don't know. Did, but you, did you jump on it as soon as it came out? Yes. For, oh, you did? Oh, right away. For me, I was like, I saw it going down, and I was sitting here's this new social media thing called Twitter. And when you send a message, it's called a tweet. And I thought, how ridiculous is this? It's a tweet, really? And I'm Stone Cold Steve Austin, a big badass, tough guy. A couple of years goes by. At some point, I've got to jump in. You know, I'm old school, stuck in the mud. So, I, I you know, I formed my Twitter account, Steve Austin BSR, talking to Heyman Hustle here but so now I, I really enjoy it and and but i never knew it would in, evolve into what it's evolved into well it's, it's, it's a it, really good chance to you know c- communicate for me at a grassroots level with my fan base it's a text message that you're sending out to the entire world right and and that's how i look at it you yeah. know it's uh i i mean I, I got it because i had a bunch of kids around me who were doing it from its very infancy you know i mean you think about this you think about this again we were talking about earlier just how fast technology moves and different platforms and and you know the choke points are content and financing and distribution think about this there was no youtube before 2005 really yeah see can, do you even remember a day where youtube wasn't around not really right it's like it's it, it's like it it's, seems like it's been here forever of course you know and and again we come from an age where you know people would say hey fax it to me right i don't know anybody who faxes anymore everything is email or you know i'll text it over to you um you know and what did people do before faxing what did people do before cell phones i mean i i hate to admit it because i'm an old man now but i actually remember the day when there were rotary telephones yeah know? too right i told my I, I was on the phone with someone the other day and a lady told me she goes i can scan it to you or i can fax it to you so i give out my fax number 
And she calls me back a couple hours later. She goes, I've been having a hard time getting this fax through to you. So I call. I told my wife, I said, I said, I give out the fax number. I said, I can't get this fax. I said, you can get the machine plugged in. She said, Steve, I stopped the fax number uh, two years ago. Two years ago, she, she, she deleted our fax number. So, I mean, I, no, nobody told me. I'm just paying all the damn bills. <laughs> but I'm still stuck in the fax age. Do you have a home phone? I still have a hard line just for the hell of it. Do you? See that, hey, well... My kids and I live in, in my, my, my dad died last June, so uh, we, we've, t- we've taken over my parents' house. Right. So I still have his old office line yeah. in the house, but nobody calls it. Right. Nobody uses it. I think the only person that calls it sometimes is I call it when everybody's cell phone in the house is, is done. Right. Because, you know, the, cell phones are not just for communication anymore. It's for Angry Birds. It's for it's it's a it's a camera. Yeah. It's a video camera. It's a playback machine. It's you know it's, it's everything. You know, cell phones are not just cell phones. So when when they burn out their cell phones, I call on that one line, right. and then usually nobody answers. And five minutes later, they call me back from their cell phones. Yes, yeah, so I use a hard line. Just to, I never answer that phone. I, when, when someone asks for my phone number, I give out my cell phone number to the select few that give it out to us. It is my lifeline. So yeah, I have a hard line, but I don't answer it. It's connected to our front gate. If someone's standing out there to push the button, then that phone rings. I know it's a UPS guy, and he's got a delivery. So, hey, is that cell phone number just so I check? Is that that uh, two eight one yeah. three? <laughs> <laughs> give out my info here. You're listening to another classic episode of the Steve Austin Show, only on Podcast One. Do you own or rent your home? Sure you do, and I bet it can be hard work. You know what's easy? Bundling policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to GEICO.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. Steve Austin. Steve Austin. Unleashed. Unleashed. I'm standing here with Polly Heyman. Paul Dangerously. Polly Heyman. It's Paul Dangerously. So do you do you go down to the office of the Heyman Hustle and just sit there and I you see these two phones? And yeah. for those of you obviously you this is not a video show, at least not yet. No, you, the, you, the one on, you got an iPhone or you get the you got you have the iPhone and the Blackberry. Of course. Which one do you like better? Well, if I'm talking, I like the iPhone. Right. And if I'm texting because my fingers are fat. I like the BlackBerry. I don't like texting on the iPhone. I don't like talking on the BlackBerry. So one is for talking and one is for texting. So what about the, the new uh, Samsung Galaxy G4, whatever the hell it is? You uh, I, 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 I'm afraid to because then I'll have three phones. Right. So right now I'm just stuck with two. I thought the BlackBerries were done. Uh, you know what? I, I hope that they're not because I really enjoy texting on them. I really don't like texting on the on the iPhone now. If if this if the Sony and also I kind of have a beef with this Galaxy thing because their advertising campaign is the next big thing, uh, and I would like a royalty check for uh, this campaign. Brock Lesnar was the next big thing. Yes, he was, and I would actually like to employ Brock to do the collections on that royalty <laughs> for me. <laughs> Just walk in that office with I Brock. I hate and go, to be the son, but <laughs> just working at Samsung when Brock Lesnar comes. Did up. you ever see the movie? Um, it's a Clint Eastwood movie. Uh, uh, is it Hamburger Hill or something? Heart- Heartbreak, Heartbreak Ridge. Ridge. Heartbreak yeah. Ridge. When they said in the Swede. Yeah, the Swede. Yeah. You, you, I mean, you know, when Brock was in yeah. college, they used to call him the Swede. Yeah. You know, because that guy looks so much like Brock. Yeah. I just, I just want to send him into Samsung, going, "I'm going to rip off your head and piss down your neck, and just let it be Brock Lesnar." And yeah, you guys owe us a royalty. <laughs> oh Jesus. I remember going back down in the road when, you know, if you needed to make a phone call, you stopped at a truck stop, a Denny's, an IHOP, a Waffle House, whatever. And then, you know, if he's making a little bit more money, you might get a, a pager, a beeper. And then all of a sudden, you know, cell phones, of course, you had the gigantic mechanical uh, cell phone thing. But technology is coming a long way, and you've ridden along with the crest. Well, you have to. You know, listen, you, you can't. A dear friend of mine is <laughs> Jimmy Iovine. And I hate to call him a dear friend because I think that sounds kind of arrogant because, you know, he's one of the, the truly most successful people in Hollywood. So it's not like, you know, Jimmy Ivey walks, walks around all day saying, I wonder how my buddy Paul Heyman's doing. Right. But he's been almost a mentor in some ways. I, I'm, I'm honored to have 
uh, known him. And in, in ECW's dying day, when we needed just a little more financing to make it a couple of weeks, just to see if we could make it on a couple of different deals, he gave us a little bit of money. He bought in, even though he knew it was a bad investment. Right. So he's a, to me, that makes him a dear friend. Anyway, uh, Jimmy is the chairman of Universal Music, Geffen, A&M, and Interscope, which is an interesting situation because Interscope was like ECW. It was a small, independent business that changed the scope of the industry. So he starts up Interscope. He sells it to a big corporation for, let's say, it's a million dollars. They don't know what to do with it. He buys it back for $100,000. Then he sells it to another big record label for $2 million. He buys it back because they don't know what to do with it for $100,000. He bought and sold his own label four or five times, making millions along the way. And finally, he merges his independent label with the biggest label in, 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 in the world, Universal Music. Jimmy Iovine is 70 years old. And since the day I've met Jimmy Iovine, the one constant in his approach is, I don't market the music that I like. I don't sell to myself. I sell to the kids that have money in their pocket that are going to buy the stuff that I put out. I am deathly afraid of being the old guy that talks about the eight track cassette or the fax machine or the mimeograph right. or back in my day because it's not my day. I don't have to like where the world progresses. I have to keep up with it because it's going to go forward without me. And I don't want to be that guy. I don't mind being the old guy in the locker room as long as I'm still the guy that has the radical ideas that can possibly change the industry. The only difference is now I'm far more diplomatic in my approach in pitching it. But I still want to be the guy that stays one step ahead of the curve and not the guy that's trying to catch up. So I hang around and I listen to as many young, bright people and aggressive and assertive and progressive thinking people as I can so that when they come they go hey man have you tried this thing called YouTube no man what's YouTube oh yeah you load up your own videos and, you know and a lot of people are pirating content on there and just throwing stuff up I watched uh, Johnny Carson from, from from the 70s and the 80s the other day and I'm going into meetings going hey Vince you were this YouTube thing goddamn pal what's YouTube and this is 2005 and I'm saying you know what this is the next big thing. So when someone comes up to me and he says, hey, I'm sending a text message out to the world. It's called Twitter. Mm -hmm. The very first thing I'm doing is going home to my kids going, hey, any of your classmates in kindergarten or first grade talking about Twitter? And as soon as I find out that the kids are talking about it, I want to know as much about it as I can. I want to learn who's behind it. I want to learn the technology and the vocabulary and the vernacular behind it because I want to be ahead of everybody else because otherwise I'm the old guy that fell behind. Right. Don't want to fall behind. Speaking of uh, Jimmy Iovine, yes, you mentioned he uh, chipped in a little bit of uh, money to ECW back in the day. I always wondered, Paul, as long as I've known uh, you and a very good friend, how and why the wheels fell off of ECW. Because from my standpoint, and you know me, dude, I'm pretty pretty damn good in 20 by 20. Pretty good on a horn. But, you know, as far as the inner workings of how you run a business or, or all that, that, that wrestling stuff, the promotion stuff, uh, don't know where to shed or wind my watch. How and why did the wheels fall, fall off? Because from my standpoint, look at the merch, look at the T-shirts, look at the energy of the program. I thought you guys were printing money. The highest grossing year ECW ever had was the last full year that we were in business, 2000. We drew back-to-back -back sellouts at the Hammerstein Ballroom, grossing well over $100,000 a night. We sold 6,800 tickets. In Los Angeles, we were regularly selling out in Detroit, 4,000 tickets, regularly selling out in Chicago, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 tickets, sold out in, uh, uh, I can't pronounce the name of the, t of the town, Masagua. It was, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's right outside of Toronto. Yeah. Uh, sold out there. would regularly sell out the Burt Flickinger Center in Buffalo, which was 4,000 seats. The, the, the highest grossing year we ever had was 2,000. Entertainment is a very funny commodity. And as we've discussed before, the, the choke points in entertainment are content. Do you have enough content? Do you have enough personalities to Define produce the content? Define choke point. Well, you know, it's funny. I've been saying it so long. I, I'm, I'm trying to find a layman's term. Because I, I know right. that this is the show 
for the working man. Um, so how the working folks? He's not I... calling us dumb. He's trying to do no, uh, no, no. Uh, uh, Choke point. I, it, it, I'm trying to translate my yeah. my hoity-toity attitude. Yeah. Uh, with my with my insider tech with my and doing it in spectacular fashion. Well, thank you, kind sir. A choke point is where can the deal go off the rails? Okay. Where, where, where can this get choked out? Okay. What's your kill zone? Gotcha. Uh, if you don't have enough talent, you don't have enough content. You don't have enough to fill that hour. Of, of a program or two hours or three hours of programming, how, whatever the case may be, then, then then you don't have content. So it's a you're you're in you you now are a content provider. If you have no guests for your podcast, you're going to sit here and give a WrestleMania preview or a post show wrap up because you had no one to talk to. You need constant flow of new guests for your podcast because that's the content you are providing. Right. Okay. What are the other two choke points? What are the other two strangleholds? Where where can it go off the rails? If you don't have this, there's no gas to fill the engine. Well, there's two things. One, financing. If you can't afford the tape recorder, if you can't afford the microphone, if you can't afford to then take this recording and digitalize it and put it out on a platform, then you don't have the money with which to forward your vision of a podcast. So when people have a movie to do or a TV show to do or a wrestling promotion, if you don't have financing, there's no promotion. The other, again, choke point is distribution. Now, I can have $10 million to produce a television show, but if nobody will put it on the air for me, I'm going to lose that $10 million because... It won't air. And if it doesn't air, how do I promote my events? How do I promote my pay-per-views? Why would anybody give me money for a license? The video game companies won't give me money. I have no way to promote their product. Why would anybody buy a T-shirt if they don't know that the wrestler wears the T-shirt? How many people would have bought the Austin 316 T-shirt if you were on local access Cox Cable Harrisburg, Pennsylvania? You sure wouldn't have any merch checks coming from Kansas City, St. Louis, Chicago, Detroit, Las Vegas, Reno, L.A., San Diego, all around the world. You made all that money. In that merch, because Pete Vince had distribution of his television show to where people saw you wear the Austin 316 shirt or the what shirt, and they said, I want to buy that too. What happened with ECW was this. Whether the company was run right or run wrong, whether it was a good product or a bad product, whether it had its day or not had its day, whether if we had survived long enough to get to the next generation of stars, and we would have had CM Punk, Daniel Bryan, Seth Rollins, Dean Ambrose, all the kids that you see coming up today or or that you have for the past few years, those would have been our guys. So what happened is that we lost our distribution. We lost TNN, which became Spike TV, because they were owned by Viacom, and they cut that huge multi-million dollar deal with Vince. We were going to move then to USA Network. The president of the network, Stephen Chow, was hot to get ECW to replace WWE, then WWF. Barry Diller, the chairman of the board of USA Network back in that, in that era, made the decision, if I can't have the number one program, which he did, clearly, WWE, then why would I want the number two or number three program? Can't be number one? I'm going to change the image of the station. Turner, which had a distribution channel for wrestling and was going to dump WCW, had such a bad taste in their mouth from WCW, they wanted nothing to do with wrestling. So I'm out on that platform. The only other big platform at the time was going to be Fox. Arthur Smith, who now has his own production company called A. Smith Co., and I worked with them to do some of the UFC countdown shows. Um, And they did a lot of stuff with uh, 51 Minds, who produced uh, your show as well. Um, Arthur Smith was the head of Fox Sports at the time. And Arthur Smith had the vision of doing an afternoon strip. Four o'clock in the afternoon, half hour every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. The economics of doing that show was so not viable to stay on the air that I knew we would fold 12 weeks, 13 weeks, 14 weeks down the road, if we even attempted to do the strip show. They would not give us a slot on Fox 
that I could play into, satisfy the licenses, satisfy some advertisers, and keep the company afloat. What it boiled down to was, end of the day, distribution. We had no distribution. So it didn't matter if you had a product or not, or even if we had the financing, which we didn't because the pay-per-view companies held back our money. When we went into bankruptcy, this is something that is a very funny, well, it's not a funny story. It's, it's a kind of a sad story. But when we went into bankruptcy, we were owed $2.8 million by the pay-per-view companies. And they wouldn't even give us 10% of our money because they literally, and I'll call him out on this, the executive vice president of In Demand was a guy by the name of Dan York. And Dan York said to me, once you get distribution, we'll give you your money. We owe you $2.8 million. But if you don't get distribution, we know you're going down. And it's going to be cheaper for us to pay pennies on the dollar to a bankruptcy trustee than to just give you money now and bet that you'll be around in six months. Wow. And the day that conversation happened, which was when Mindy Herman was going to leave uh, in demand to go back to running the E-Network, so she couldn't help us. And Brian Rico, who was a huge ally of ours, uh, was overpowered by Dan York because he, Dan York was the one guy that outranked Brian Rico. So no one could stop this tyrant. And he had just done the same thing to Bob Arum, but Bob Arum had enough finances to take them to federal court and sue them right. and get his money and then settle on a new distribution deal for pay-per-view. Had we gotten enough distribution, we would have stayed in business and redefined the company. The fact that we couldn't get distribution makes me the schmuck, the bad businessman that everybody points to to this day, even though if you consider this, even though we were owed $2.8 million, the total debt of the company was $7 million, four of which was my family's investment in the business. And then again, if we had gotten that 2.8, that could have carried us for years. Still, the company went down Seven million dollars in the hole, and that was the end. We were bankrupt. TNA has lost that much in a month, many, many times. That company has to be, and I don't know their finances today, but when I was speaking to them a couple of years ago about coming in to to be the president of the company, I know that there were people in that company telling me they were seventy, eighty, close to ninety million dollars in debt, which means they had to have months where they lost $7 million. Took us seven years to lose $7 million, and we still had $3 million coming in right. that we just couldn't get our hands right. on, that we couldn't collect. So again, now that we understand the word choke point, we know that content's a choke point. If you have content, you're fine. We had the content. So the two choke points become financing and distribution. If we had the distribution, we could have had the financing. Right. But once you didn't have that distribution... You're out of business. And then no money to go back and sue the camp for the 2.8. Could never have afforded the lawsuit. You're listening to another classic episode of the Steve Austin Show, only on Podcast One. Hey, y'all. Taking a moment to share a new podcast, True Underdog, recently launched by four times Entrepreneur of the Year award winner, Jason Waller. It's real, it's raw, it's motivational. If you're looking for inspiring stories and killer entrepreneurship advice, you got to head over and subscribe to True Underdog Podcast. Jason Waller is the definition of a true underdog. He was raised in a trailer park, suffered childhood abuse, was kicked out of high school, and became a dad in his teens. After struggling to care for his young family and hearing the words no and you can't too many times, Jason found the power within and used his street smarts to start three companies from the ground up with his latest venture, Power Home Solar, on the path to becoming a billion-dollar enterprise. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling motivated already. And trust me when I tell you, this guy's energy is contagious. Head over to True Underdog Podcast to hear how Jason and his high-profile guests turn their lives around to achieve massive success. Subscribe to True Underdog Podcast on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or your favorite podcast app. What kind of play was that on this part? Because to me, as a man, a dirtbag play. As a business strategist, smart play for him. I mean, it was a weasel move. 
I you know, don't. If your mother, if you owe so much money, you pay the money. Oh, it was a scumbag. I mean, I hate the guy to this right. day. I mean, you know, and I mean, I, I, I'm. So then you can understand why I did it. No, actually, I think it was. I, th- I also think it was a bad business move, because had he kept another promotion involved, right. he would have had enough. See, that's why once we went out of business, so many other promotions found it easy to get on to in demand because they were dying for content. Yeah. They needed new content providers, and they were a distribution channel of pay-per-view. Had they kept us alive with the money that they owed us, then nobody could have held them up. They would have retained more leverage than they had with Vince McMahon. They would not be dictated to. They would also retain more leverage when UFC came aboard. Well, they were seeking out boxing promotions because we were giving them a steady flux of income. We did three pay-per-views our first year, four our second, uh, six our third, and they ordered seven for the year that we went out of business. And they probably would have bumped us up to 10 or 12. Once we went out of business, it, it literally set a shockwave through them because WCW went out of business at the very same time. So now they were starving for content to fill all these pay-per-view days. I think it was a dumb move on his part, too, because why wouldn't you keep that revenue source alive? Right. We would have certainly drawn them more than $3 million in the year 2001 based on the brand name of ECW. Had they given us our money, we would have retained Rob Van Dam. We could have at least had the money to... Fu- See, I couldn't do the Fox Sportsnet deal because I didn't have the money to come out of the gate with it to then demonstrate to in demand I had a viable uh, distribution channel. Had they given us the money, I could have afforded the the, the, um, the strip show or could have at least done the strip show long enough to say, hey, why not put us on FX? Why not put us on Fox? Could you give a, Could you give us a bigger distribution here at nighttime and on a, on a better time slot and, and, and more than 30 minutes? Could we do something other than an afternoon strip? I would have had options. I could have maybe gone into the syndication, back into the syndication business. I would have had far more options. I didn't have the financing because we were out of money and we're owed $2.8 million. And every time we put on a pay-per-view, it's $250,000 in production costs to have live satellite feeds. When the door shut, ECW is no more. You went then to WWF at the time, right? Immediately. Okay, so but while then, while I was filing for bankruptcy. Yeah. So while all this process is going on, and uh, you know, a couple of boys probably missing paychecks, but just just how how did you deconstruct everything and return just to normal life and get rid of all the headaches that were that you know throughout you know everything that you'd built up? Well, it's kind of like I, I jumped from the frying pan into the fire because I immediately went from ECW onto the writing staff at WWE. And that, and that was a full-time 24-7 yeah. gig as well, especially with Vince now looking for new ideas, looking for something different, looking for someone that had a different voice than he had and offering the contrarian opinion, which when I first came aboard, that was my job. Right. My job was to offer the contrarian opinion to, to what their process had been. Right. Which is why when uh, he split the writing teams in 2002, he assigned Brian Gewertz to writing Raw and assigned me to writing SmackDown and said, do something different with that show so it doesn't look like Raw. So I never really had a break. I never had a chance to decompress. I never, I never had a chance to go through withdrawal from my own company because I went from my own company straight into being a bombastic member of, of this writing team while also immediately I was, and I, and I never intended to be on the air either. I, part of, you know, again, here, here's a funny thing about this company, and you know this as well as anybody. You always end up doing the one thing that you never envisioned that you would do. When I cut my deal to come aboard the writing team in WWE, Vince says, I want to know what your parameters are. I want to know what limitations you have. And I says, as a writer, as a director, as a producer, you know, I have no limitations. There is, I can take this as far as you will allow me to take. If, you're, if your offer here is opportunity, you have someone that is, that is ambitious enough to take as much opportunity as you're going to offer me. The only thing I don't want to do is... I never want to be on the air again. I'm done being on the air. Goddamn, pal, you don't have anything to worry about. We're fine with that. If you don't want to be on the air, you'll never be on the air. And a couple weeks later, and you know, and, and I'm getting all the bankruptcy papers ready, I'm sitting at home, and all of a sudden my phone starts ringing, and everybody's saying, hey, man, Jerry Lawler just walked out because they fired his wife. And I'm thinking, 
oh man, there's no way they're going to ask. No, there's no way they're going to ask me to do that. Vince told me I'll never have to be on the air. And of course, by, you know, by that Wednesday, JR's going to be going, I haven't heard your name yet, but you know, if they ask me, I just want to tell you, I thought, you know, Oklahoma boy, smart ass New York Jew. I'm telling you, we were pretty damn good back in the day, you know? And I'm like, nah, come on. I mean, I haven't done commentary in, 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 in 12 years. Why, why would they have me do commentary? I'm the ECW guy. I'm a booker. I'm a, next thing you know, you know, that Thursday, I get a call. Hey, pal, need you to step up for something here. You know, you, did you hear about the king? Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I kind of heard that, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, he's going to ask me to do one week. And he goes, need you to sit down next to JR and uh, carry Monday Night Raw for me. It's, 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 it's really what the company needs you to do the most. And I just, I, I know it's not what we talked about at first, but it's what, uh, it's what the company needs you to do. It's what I need you to do. Now, what am I going to say? <laughs> My company is folding. I'm coming aboard on this brand new job for a guy I've known since I was 14 years old and who I've never worked for in the past. And the only dealings I've done with him since I broke into the business has been on an owner to owner basis where, you know, we're, we're I mean, I, I don't mean that we're peers in terms of the scope of our company. Right. But he was an owner of a company. I was an owner of a company. Right. So he did what was best for WWE, and I did what was best for ECW. And in that way, we were peers. And now I'm his employee. And what am I going to say? No, 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 no. You tell me I don't have to go on the air. And it's not like I was bad at the job. I just really never wanted to do it. So I'm sitting there saying, well, you know what? They haven't had a new host of Monday Night Raw since, since what year? Since 95 or 93. And, you know, and I do know how to broadcast with JR. And you know what? If we're going to make a splash, here's the biggest one. So I went on and I, 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 I went to work that Monday in Washington, D.C. As, as the commentator on Monday Night Raw. So whatever happened with the rest of the ECW thing? How did oh. you get all that solved? <laughs> um, I filed for bankruptcy. And I, I, I also had to file for personal bankruptcy because um, I never took a paycheck from ECW. I put my own money in. I, I survived in the 1990s on my lawsuit money from WCW, and I was really good in the stock market. For I had a lot of big years in the stock market, and that's how I survived. I never took a paycheck from my own company. Again, I drank the, I drank the Kool-Aid. It, was, it, it didn't become a business enterprise. It became a cause. And... Um, so once we filed for bankruptcy, uh, it was a matter of Vince buying the assets at, when the time was right and having to deal with all the people that would file a claim in a UCC1 filing and a claim entertainment asserting their 15% ownership and, and these people claiming, well, uh, you know, the, and, well, we own the footage because we're owed money. So once all the lawyers got involved and it took a couple of years to settle, yeah. once that got settled, Vince ended up owning everything. So you threw out all those le le legal terms just now, and now you're probably an expert at it. But at the at that time, I mean, you're like Jesus Christ. I mean, what the fuck is this? Well, everybody's going to have you know when 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 the ship goes down, everybody has a claim, and a, right. I'm not saying that that their claim is is not a righteous claim. A, a claim entertainment, the video game company owned 15 percent of the company, right. so they were the ones saying, well, since we own 15 percent the intellectual property rights and the footage of the, uh, uh, f from all the TV shows should revert to us because we are minority owners. At the same time, and this was obviously used against them, uh, they owed the company, which we didn't know. It was found out in, in the bankruptcy proceedings. Uh, they actually owed us a lot of money in royalties that they hadn't given us. Right. So that kind of negated their claim. And then they went into their own bankruptcy. So they kind of ended up being out of the picture. But then you have everybody else that's filing, oh, I'm owed money for this or I'm owed money for that or I was owed money on this royalty or I'm owed money for these pay-per-views. And you have to sift through the, the, the trustee. And, and, and the trustee was so overwhelmed by the enormous Normity of the claims, not only against us, but to sit there and then say, well, what are the assets of the company? Well, the assets of the company include the outstanding invoices that we have out. Well, what outstanding invoices are that? And they think we're going to say, well, we're owed 50 grand for this box office and we didn't get our T-shirt money from this distributor. Oh, we're owed $2.8 million from the pay-per-view company. Oh, my God. Well, we got to file a lawsuit against them. Yeah, go right ahead. I think you ought to. And get that guy, Dan York, while you're at it. Get that guy in a deposition and let me attend it on that day. But 
That's not what was best for the purchaser of the assets, which was the publicly traded stock WWE, because at the end of the day, what they wanted to do as, as a company was they wanted to acquire the assets of ECW and exploit the tape library, if not the intellectual property of being able to actually put on an ECW program. And there you have it. And that's what happened. So finally, and at the end of 2004, the bankruptcy settled to where um, WWE purchased the assets of ECW and released the rise and fall of ECW videotape. You know, DV- and again, see, again, we talk about technology. Nobody does videotapes anymore, right. which is why, you know, and, 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 and they finally ran out of, out of interesting people to interview for their own uh, documentary. So I'll call it a documentary, and, you know, they still call it a DVD. Yeah. But within a year, there'll be no more DVDs. It'll just be Blu-ray. And a year from that, there'll be no more Blu-rays. It'll be something else. So I refuse to call it a Heyman DVD, it's the Heyman documentary. But back then, it was the ECW documentary, the rise and fall of ECW, and they probably thought, hey, you know what, at least we'll make a few dollars back. Maybe we'll cover our costs for the lawyers for the bankruptcy and acquiring the assets. And lo and behold, it became the biggest selling DVD, videotape, blue, whatever you call it, in WWE history. It caught them so off guard it sold out everywhere to where no no stores could carry it best buy and pc richards and 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 uh kmart and um and whatever else was a tower records whatever was around back right. then because those distribution channels have changed as well everybody sold out on it so by the time it was done it sold like a half million units and this was the biggest thing that, that had ever hit the, the video business in, in WWE. So at the time, Vince says, well, man, what are we going to do? And it was actually Rob Van Dam that said, hey, man, you know, before everybody gets too old, uh, you ought to do one more show. But it has to be authentic. It has to be real. Um, but I had a big falling out with WWE right as the DVD came out. Why? Uh, because I listened into a conference call that uh, I was supposed to be on a SmackDown conference call. And I listened into the Raw conference call. What'd you hear? Uh, actually, you know, this is funny. Um, and, and this is a story in and of itself. I got sent home because I got busted listening in to the raw conference call. And the truth of the matter is I didn't really listen into that call. What, what happened is those conference calls back, back in, in December 2004 were so brutal because Vince was home on Saturdays and he was bored. So we're going to review the shows. Now, we already reviewed the show on Thursday, and we already reviewed the show on Friday. And most of the writers back then, as you will no doubt recall, because you didn't like them either, were these, as Freddie Blassie would say, pencil neck geeks who had no sex life whatsoever. I had a healthy sex life at home and two small children to boot. These writers didn't have children nor sex lives. I had both. And I wanted some time at home because I was working all the time. Yeah. So Saturday morning, to have a chance to take my children down to the park, which is at the back of the school, which is five minutes from my house, seemed like a blessing. But Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, the conference call would start. What do we have for the pay-per-views? And we discussed the pay-per-views. And then... Because Raw was, was the flagship show, let's discuss Raw. SmackDown, I'll tell you when to come back on. But the problem was, you know Vince. Um, okay, I'm done with Raw. SmackDown needs to step up right now. Okay, so Vince runs away to take a bathroom break for a minute or to grab a protein bar or whatever he's doing. And by the time he comes back on the horn, if the SmackDown team's not on, he's going through the show without you. Right. So I don't have time to be at the park with my kids and I get the call from whomever the, whomever the assistant was by then going, okay, Vince is ready for you. Okay, I gotta go, I gotta go. And I have to drive back home because by the time I drive back home and, and get in front of my computer, Vince is going through the show. I'm a slave to the process of being on the phone for the conference call. So my girlfriend squeeze significant other mother of my children sweetheart love of my life however she could be phrased she and i came up with the idea that friday night would be our night out and once we went out on friday night i would stay up all night writing the show i'd send it to 
uh, my assistant writer, who at the time was David Lagana. David Lagana would type out the show. By this time, I think I, I think Lagana was probably the uh, Lagana was now by now either the co-writer or the lead writer, whatever it was. That that was our process. I'd stay up till five o'clock in the morning. He'd type it out. He'd send it out at six o'clock in the morning. We'd say hello to everybody at ten o'clock in the morning, and then I'd go back to sleep, and she would take the kids to the park. So when Nicole came in, Vince is ready for you. I'm home already. I run to the bathroom. I do my thing. I run downstairs. I pour my iced tea or my coffee or whatever. The computer's already on. I'm on the line. And one way to do that was when the 10 o'clock call uh, would end, I wouldn't get off the line. I'd stay on the line. I'd put the phone back in the charger, and I'd go to sleep, and I'd have the phone on mute. Hey, you need it on the phone. I'm already on the phone. Right. I'm there already. On that particular day, when I put the phone in the charger, it was unplugged. And so the battery, after about two hours on the phone, dies. So Vince is on the line. And of course, they're talking about the most sensitive subjects in the world. And this is back in, De- this is back in November. And they're talking about Raw's contribution to WrestleMania. They're on a tear. They're actually booking this thing out to WrestleMania. So imagine how top secret this is. And all of a sudden you hear, click. And I didn't say my name. And they hear, blank, has left the conference. And they go, oh my God, someone (laughs) is listening in to our phone call. And they, they research who called into the call. And of course, that's Paul's number. So, <laughs> so they come to me, and you, Stephanie was so angry at me because I was on her team, yeah. which made her look so bad to Vince. And Stephanie comes to me, and she says, how could you do this to me? Do you know how, how angry my father is at me? How could you listen in to the raw curl? I want an explanation from you. Look me in the eyes and tell me why on this day, December 3rd, 2004, you listened in to the raw conference call. And as God is my witness, on my children, I swore to her, I didn't listen in. Because the fact was, on that particular day, I went back to sleep. And I didn't listen in to the raw call. And I enraged her so bad. And Vince was so mad at me. And he would say to me, look me in the face and tell me, just give me a reason why. Why would you listen in to the raw call? And I would say to him, you know, you're the guy that wants ruthless aggression. You want true competition within your company. Now, if I thought that that raw show was truly competitive with the stuff I'm putting on SmackDown, you damn right I would listen into that call. I would, I would hack their emails. I would, I would, I would steal their mail. I would, I, I would put a cup up against the wall if I knew you were having a meeting in the next room. And you damn right I would listen to the conference call because you can't tell me that if you knew that Eric Bischoff and Ted Turner were having a conference call in 1997 and you had that code, that you wouldn't listen in. He goes, good, so you're going to tell me now that you listen in. And I said, Vince, I didn't listen in to that call because the fact was I didn't. And here's the part that they've never known ever before. It's your exclusive to run with. So help me God, Steve. I didn't listen in to that call. But I did listen in to the six other calls in the previous weeks before that. But since they never asked me if I did, I never copped to it. <laughs> Jesus Christ. You're a piece of work. So, so, so they threw me out after I did a casket match with Heidenreich and The Undertaker. Yeah. And The Undertaker tombstone me and put me into the casket, which was my farewell. <laughs> but then they tried to put together this ECW show, and it was going all wrong, which is, of course, the history of ECW. And by the time we hit March... Uh, Shane is calling me saying, hey, you mind uh, coming in for a meeting? I don't want to get you too close to my old man, but maybe you could just talk to me about it. And the first thing I said was, book the Hammerstein Ballroom. Don't go to the ECW arena. Right. 
And once they took a look at the Hammerstein Ballroom, they said, well, what's the show going to be? And Rob Van Dam said to Vince, again, Rob Van, this was Rob Van Dam's idea. He says, hey, man, just so you know, if Paul's not writing it and producing it, it's not going to be authentic. You have to let this be his vision, his flow. He he understands this product because baby. it was his. Yeah, it's my baby. So uh, Vince and I had our, I'm sure you've had these meetings, you know, where you walk in the room and he goes, I don't know if this is going to be a hug or if we're going to be throwing around the furniture, you know? <laughs> and I, I always remember that. That was, his, that, that was the thing with you and him. And, and, you know, when you guys saw each other in the hotel room in LA and, and, uh, you know, and my, my thing always was, well, at least it won't be a long fight because <laughs> he'd whip my ass really, really good. And the only hopes I had was, boy, I'm just wondering though, if I just got in one lucky shot, well, what's he going to tell people? Eh, that Heyman got me, you know? But I said, well, can we just do the hug? And he's, and he's him doing a hug it was such a great Vince move he gives me a handshake and he says uh let's see how the meeting goes before we do a huggy <laughs> and you know here you have this big barrel chested bodybuilder you know and he's Vince McMahon you know and he, he could whip my ass 15 times over and when he just says something like that like a huggy it just I'll give him so it just you know how he is yeah. it breaks the ice yeah. and we sat there we had this wonderful conversation about what I envisioned the show to be and um, he said, I'm at TV Monday and Tuesday. I'm back here Wednesday. And, and it, it, classic Vince, where they were in Phoenix or something that, that Tuesday. And he goes, I'll probably be back back here around 4 o'clock in the morning. And you know me, I can't sleep. Uh, and uh, that Monday night, I have, I have to talk to somebody on Monday night after the show. So I won't have time to work out. So I'm going to miss a workout. When I come back, I'm going to work out till I puke. I'm going to work out till I puke. I said, oh, that's really nice. I usually, you know, eat pizza till I puke. Yeah. And he says, uh, what are you doing Wednesday morning around 7 a.m.? I said, I don't know, probably going to bed. And he goes, let's meet then because I'll just be done working out and I'll, I'll sleep sometime on Wednesday. And we met the next Wednesday because I was in the office at Wednesday at 7, 7 a.m. We actually wrote out the first version of the show. And from there, they just kept me around enough to, to write ECW One Night Stand. You're listening to another classic episode of The Steve Austin Show, only on Podcast One. Do you own or rent your home? Sure you do, and I bet it can be hard work. You know what's easy? Bundling policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to GEICO.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's Geico Easy. Visit Geico.com today. That's Geico.com. How crazy is this? He's, he's the hardest working guy I've ever met in my life. He's got to be up there high on your schedule. On, on your, uh, I mean, the dude doesn't like to sleep. The, the thing with Vince is he doesn't even like to sneeze because it's an involuntary action which you cannot control. Well, it's a control thing. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, and I told this to, you know, you know Ariel Helwani, the MMA reporter. Yes. And I told him this story. I was in a meeting once with Vince. And, and you know you can't sneeze around him either. you got to leave the room. Yeah, because oh, germs. Yeah. 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 But, uh, well, and because he, he, he loses respect for you because you couldn't control the sneeze. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. So, so I'm sitting there. And we are going over again another very long range storyline, and I'm and I got him sold on this. I mean, I'm I'm saying, man, I just booked out the rest of the year. I mean, we're at we're at Survivor Series, and I just gave him the Rumble into Mania, and he's buying my two main events that I'm pitching, and I have his attention. He has not said a word for 15 minutes, and we are staring at each other in the eye. And it's just one of those days where it just gels with him. And he's buying it. And all of a sudden he goes, Achoo! And I realized about five minutes into the continuation of the pitch, he is not hearing a word that I'm saying. I'm just flapping my gums. And, it, you know, it's like, it's, it's like one of those things that in the movies where all you see is the person's mouth going, yeah. kak, 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 kak. he's not hearing a word I'm saying. And he's literally mumbling to himself. I said, Vince, you okay? And he goes, I sneezed. Gesundheit! <laughs> you know, do, you, yeah. do you need a yeah. tissue? You take my sleeve, you know? Yeah. What do you want? And he goes, I sneezed. Uh, 
I should be better than that. I, I should be able to control that. I don't like that. I was like, you don't like sneezing? And he goes, in my world, pal, there is no sneezing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so in, in my world, there is, there is no sneezing. Yeah. Okay. Well, how do you argue with that? You don't. You don't. Because in his world, <laughs> there's no sneezing. <laughs> there's no sneezing. <laughs> I'm ready to go eat lunch. May I join you, sir? Yes. And come back and do another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> is anybody still listening to us oh yeah right now if people are listening to us steve's cell phone number is 281 <laughs> <laughs> jesus christ who's the craziest son that you ever met in the history of the business that we're not going to speak disparagingly of but in a fun way uh the boys off the wall well i mean to what degree i mean crazy well, yeah, what way yeah, yeah. You know, let me tell you something. When I first came in ECW, you talk about a <laughs> messed up locker room, mister. I mean, because, you know, there at the famous ECW arena, there was a lot of spaces and cubby holes and stuff. Well, the statute of limitations has run out on yeah, a lot of things yeah. that we were doing back then, so you can freely it was, that. That, that, that was an interesting place. No, just as far as a character. It was Caligula, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, yeah there it was, uh, there uh, was sex, drugs, and rock and roll going on in that locker room. Beyond description. And was people it? have tried to describe it and have failed to do so, I might add. It was an interesting dynamic. I, I, I hooked up with the pit bulls, and those two two good guys, and had a blast with them. And I, I had, a, I had my, my entire stay there, I enjoyed uh, uh, my, my time in ECW. It was a bunch, it was a bunch of good guys. Well, the only demand on, on the performers that we had was just do everything you can to give the people a show and do the best to present yourself in the, in, in, as a performer as best as you can. I mean, that, that was... It, it was a theater company. Yeah. You know, and, and that's how I envisioned it. It was a theater company, and I wanted to get things out of my performers that nobody else could get out, and I wanted the people who came to our shows to acknowledge the fact that this is the best damn show they could ever see. Hey, but man, going back to the, uh, when, I, when I asked you about when the wheels will, fell off and how they fell off, and you, you broke all that down, but man... I seen all y'all's great ECW shirts when y'all were on television. I mean, y'all had to sell a shit pile of merch. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, we did actually very. You know, we did very well. We just kept investing the money back right. into the company. And again, you know, we, we didn't we didn't have TNA's financing. TNA is financed by by a billionaire. You know, yeah. and 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 we and we didn't have a network that was backing us. And if we had a network that was backing us, that would have been a different story. And we 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 didn't have enough licenses that we could sell. Um, you know, it goes like this. Um, Back in the 90s, uh, a group that wanted to distribute our pay-per-views was Semaphore Entertainment. And they, it was Bob Meyerowitz, David Isaacs, Campbell McLaren, and, and, and their EVP, uh, Michael Abramson. And Semaphore is a name that some people may, may recognize because Semaphore owned UFC. They were the creators of and, and, and the first owners of UFC. Oh. And they were the ones that John McCain called the promoters of human cockfighting. They could not get clearance on pay-per-view. They were banned in so many, in 38 states or whatever the, whatever the number really was. And of course, you know, the big moment happened when they were trying to get their Nevada license. And if they couldn't get the Nevada license, they were going to go out of business. And Lorenzo Fertitta was on the, was it Lorenzo or Frank? I think it was Lorenzo. And if it was Frank, I'm sure someone will correct me on when they tweet me on Twitter. And uh, one of the Fertitta brothers was a member of the Nevada State Athletic Commission. And they went to Bob Meyerowitz afterwards and said, this is so interesting. We'd like to buy it. So the Fertitta brothers bought UFC uh, and formed Zuffa Entertainment. What does Zuffa stand for? I have absolutely no okay. idea. I wish I knew. And I feel ignorant not knowing that answer. And I should know the answer, but I don't. Um, stands for the owners of UFC. So uh, the Fertitas famously went $44 million in the hole with Dana White as the president of the company before they came up with the reality show, The Ultimate Fighter, which turned around their fortunes and, and, and helped them become a multi-billion dollar company. They had $44 million to lose over the course of the four years that they had before they launched that TV show. 
I didn't have $44 million to lose. I didn't even lose $7 million. We actually only lost, if you think about it, four, because 2.8 of it was owed to us by the pay-per-view distributors who didn't give us our money. But that's business, because I'm sure that there's a lot of other businesses. Hey, when THQ went out of business, they didn't give Vince McMahon and WWE the royalties on the video games that they had already sold. Right. They went bankrupt. That's what a bankruptcy happens. And one of the things when you're in business is you have to have the ability to withstand that type of a loss when your invoices don't get paid to stay in business for the next day. ECW should never have lasted one day. And that's, and that's the part of ECW that people don't truly understand. We weren't designed to last a day. We, we, we took this vision thinking, how, how can we survive a day? Hey, but on the day that we survive, let's give them the best show that we possibly can. And we survived seven years that way. And I don't find that the fact that we went out of business to make, the, 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 that defines ECW as unsuccessful. Bubba Ray Dudley, of all people, had the greatest analogy I ever heard. And I've heard other people say similar things, but he phrased it the best. He said, ECW was Napster. It absolutely changed the business. It changed the way the business looked at talent. It changed the way the business did television. It changed the presentation of the business, and it made the business recognize and seek out far more contemporary storylines, far more contemporary characters, far more contemporary, far more contemporary music. He said, and just like Napster, it changed the industry and had its time. And its effect on the industry was to change the industry. And honestly, back in those days, our goal wasn't to become millionaires, though that would have been nice. Right. Our goal was to change the business. That was the cause. That was the Kool-Aid. We're going to revolutionize the business. We're going to change the industry. And that's what we did. And it ran its course. So I don't think that it was unsuccessful because it went out of business. I actually think ECW was successful because it, it lived up to its goal. It changed the industry. And once it changed the industry, its time was over. And with that being said, we can't end on any other note. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us for another classic episode of The Steve Austin Show. Please leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts and tell your friends. For more Steve Austin Show, go to podcastone.com. That's podcastone.com. New to Podcast One Sportsnet, Michael Irvin and Ron Jaworski. The MIP. I am the MVP of the MIP. I am Michael Irvin, and I got a great show. It was a shock. It was a shock okay. to the system. <laughs> <laughs> I went to practice the next day. I made every tackle. No big deal. Any other coach out here? You lose, you will leave too. But let me tell you what I pulled out of last week. It made me say, oh, that's a playmaker right there. Y'all saw it. I'm the guy, right? <laughs> I'm the guy. I'm it's the guy. Real. Look out! Trouble is coming. <laughs> Hello, everyone. This is Eagles Hall of Fame quarterback Ron Jaworski, and I am so excited to bring you the hottest new podcast for the NFL and gaming. Welcome to Jaws Picks, featuring me, Ron Jaworski, as I give you my expert analysis and predictions of each and every NFL game. And you could hear the quarterbacks like it was a yeah, practice. Yeah. And man, I was just loving hearing the quarterbacks call everything at the line of scrimmage. You know, they've kind of solved some of their problems over the last couple of weeks, man. They were getting gutted on defense, but that's 53.3% correct against the spread. Download new episodes of the Michael Irvin Podcast every Thursday and Jaws Picks with Ron Jaworski every Wednesday and Friday on all your favorite podcasting platforms.